Welcome to the Lifelinks Podcast, all you sassy Latinas. This is where you come to hear stories that resonate with you, help you discover your true cultural identity, tossing off the need to fit in, and standing out with your authenticity, because that is your superpower. I'm your host, Consuelo Crosby, and also the creator of this content. If there's anything you'd like to share, please reach out to us on our Instagram social media at lifelinks, that's L-N-X-X, or through our website at thelinks.com. Of course, come here for some love and chat sessions with our fab guests from the comunidad. Sit back, have your cafecito, maybe some vino, whatever you like, we are bringing the sisterhood to you. Hola, chicas. Welcome to the Lifelinks podcast, where Latinas are free to speak their truth in this comunidad of welcome. I'm your host, Consuelo Crosby, here with you every Wednesday to introduce you to the amazing women who join us on the show every other week, and then followed by a pod club episode the next week. I don't want to make this intro long because today's guest is absolutely epic. Every second of this episode will have you hanging on to each word that our guest Valeria Allo shares with us. Get your tissues out because you will be crying from the get-go as she vulnerably shares her truth with such raw emotion that it's as though you lived her life alongside her. Valeria Allo, native Argentinian, award-winning author of Uncolonized Latinas, founder of the Rising Together movement, double master recipient with an MBA and master's in spiritual science, right there will give you a little hint about what this entire episode is all about. From business admin to spiritual science and everything in between. Valeria will take you through her courageous decision to leave her beloved Argentina with her husband and moved to Dartmouth, New Hampshire, in order to study for her MBA. Successfully rising in corporate ranks, becoming a mother of two, all the things, until her universe and her body said enough. And she burned out from the chronic stress of being full-time mother and full-time professional, but not from her inabilities, far from it. Instead, from the cultural messages that get ingrained in us from a very young age and the behaviors that stem from it. And still, these cultural messages, or interference as Valeria calls them, would be the catalyst to her self-discovery and return to the beautiful, spiritual woman she was born to be, whose goal is to raise all women up in confidence and self-value for success. If you don't finish this episode, you will truly be missing out on the most uplifting, positive endings to a difficult story that will teach each of you the profound joy and power of living an ordinary life. A life where love and time flow freely and where the chance to build community takes precedence. And with that community, we make change. Change for our comunidad leaving the cultural messages behind forever. You will be jumping out of your seat and wanting to offer abrazos for Valeria in camaraderie and the chance to revel in our good life. Welcome to the Lifelinks podcast, Valeria. We are so honored that you have some time to share with us today and to discuss your book, which we are eager to hear about, and the rising movement. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So first off, just to give some background to our listeners, tell us about your heritage and what brought you here to the U.S. I'm from Argentina, from a small town called General Belgrano. And I moved to Buenos Aires at the age of 18 to study. I was the first one in my family to attend college. So I was working full time. The story of many children of immigrants in the U.S. as well, right? Working full time to pursue a college education and being the first one in your family. Since I was very little, my parents who did not have access to that type of education, they planted the seed, the vision, right? They had no idea 
how to pay for my education. So, but I honor that they planted the higher vision, which is something that I took as a lesson for the rest of my life. You know, dream bigger was essentially the essence, even though you don't know how you will get there or you may not have the money or the resources, just dream bigger and think things start to align. And I became the first one to go to corporate. That's where I met my husband. And at that point, um, he said he wanted to study an MBA, a master's in business administration. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going abroad. I'm staying in Argentina. <laughs> well, here we are. Yeah, I came here 20 years ago in 2002 for our MBA. So you wanted to aspire to something bigger, but you still wanted to stay in Argentina. But then came and landed where? Both of us studied at the Tax School of Business at Dartmouth, and then continued my corporate career until 2016 that I burnt out as a mother, full-time mother, full-time professional, but we can go deeper into that. So essentially, that's my journey from Argentina, proud Latina, immigrant, and mother of two teenagers born in the U.S. Wow. Oh, congratulations. Wow, you made a courageous journey here, a beautiful life here, and truly a strong woman. Um, did you have any expectation or known of what it would be like? Or were you coming here completely open to whatever you were to experience? Honestly, I had no idea what to expect because we had no budget to travel and to get to know the schools. So we applied to a few schools and all that we could see were pictures in a brochure. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, 20 years ago, the information yeah, on the Internet true. was really limited and so mm -hmm. I'm talking to alumni, that's all we got. And mm -hmm. my husband always said that he wanted to ski a lot and snowboard a lot, and, which happens in Patagonia, in the south of Argentina, but we never Absolutely. had the opportunity to live there. So he said, this is very close to Patagonia, Argentina. It's going to be like being home, but a little colder. At that point, it was a little bit of a mess. 2001 in Argentina was a chaotic crisis, economic crisis, big time devaluation, inflation, um, civic unrest. It was, was really tough everywhere we went, even within our homes because of these sickness situations. We applied to five schools. I think we were accepted to three. I have to say our GMATs, the scores that we had in our tests were really high. We worked really hard, really hard oh. for those tests. Great school, great school. I mean, like school, great opportunity. And they opened the doors in ways that no other schools did for us. You know, we got a uh, financial aid. Uh, they made the, pro the process very simple for us, which as an immigrant, and English is your second language, when you need to fill all this paperwork, you know, you don't know what you're getting into. No one in your family has done that before. So they made it very easy for us. And it's a, a small school. So we felt mm -hmm. we were going to be supported. Okay, I've been to Patagonia, I hiked glaciers down there, and I've been to New Hampshire, and I think there's a bigger difference than just one's colder than the other. So what did you think? No, the first day here was very different. So we landed JFK, drove all the way up to New Hampshire, and in the summer, July, actually, 2002, and when we got there, we had no idea what to expect. We had rented a home via the internet, which was not what we expected. And it had no heat in the winter, just to say something something about it, in Vermont. <laughs> I remember, like, living in Argentina, for me, was heartbreaking. You know, I have two brothers, oh. my family, very close to my family. I cried, I believe, for two entire weeks, possibly. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. going to school was, where am I? Where am I? What have I done? You know, can I go back? I want to go back. What is this going to be like? And I had this deep feeling that I was going to be transformed. And it felt very scary to me at, at that point. I felt that I had this opportunity that was huge in front of me, but I could not even grasp how that was going to change my life. I knew it was going to change my life. But at that point, sitting there in that huge auditorium, it felt more like, how are these people going to brainwash me? I was afraid of being brainwashed, you know, into somebody who oh. I was not. Yeah, are they going uh -huh. to turn me into somebody who I am not? Is this experience going to change who I am and what I believe in and what I value? It was mm -hmm. a cultural shock, I realize now. I was in a yeah. shock, you know, trying to figure out where I was. It was not easy, mm -hmm. but that was my first few weeks in the U.S. Oh, gosh, that is so harsh. Ah, uh, it breaks. 
And I know there must be a lot of other stories out there in our listeners just like this. Oh, when you come from a different culture here, culture shock is a beautiful definition of what you experience. But did you know it at the time, though, that you were in that state of shock? Or was there an overriding voice just saying, keep going, keep going, keep going? Definitely keep going. And um, I always did very well in academic settings, you know, so I put mm-hmm. all my energy into that. Then when it came to looking for a job to pay for the huge loans we had, it was very hard because we were in 2002 after 9-11. And oh, visas were not sponsored. Yeah. We had a student visa. And also I wanted to live with my husband in the same city, ideally and in the same building. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had to find one a One would think. Yes. <laughs> so we had been married only for one year when we came. And by the time we graduated, we had been married for three years, you know, and oh, yeah. I got jobs in another state. And I interviewed with more than 50 companies to land jobs in the same wow. city as he was landing. So that added a layer of complexity. Uh, mm-hmm. But looking back... I just wanted to succeed. I just wanted to do well. And I was very focused and determined in that to the point Mm -hmm. that I missed a little bit the social part. I felt um, kind of a stranger. I didn't belong. I used to hang out only with people who spoke Spanish. And I Mm -hmm. know now that I missed a lot. So when we have a reunion, I introduce myself again to my classmates. (laughs) And I say, you know, yeah. And I say, I'm sorry I missed meeting you 20 years ago because you're amazing and I was too afraid and in a bubble, in a way, trying mm-hmm. to protect myself. Now I can see I was in a cultural shock and trying to figure things out. Mm-hmm. That's very understandable, especially the focus. You went through so much. You went through so much because there's the emotional part, the relationship with your husband. And there's so much work you're doing behind the scenes. But did you feel at the time that there was a lot of diversity to feel at least part of the system, part of the culture, or was it purely that Hmm. I'm sticking out here? Back then, the school was very intentional about diversity and bringing diverse Hmm. students. However, systemically, we were not embraced. Um, I believe that there was a lot of progress. We have seen even how now Dartmouth all the, the effort that they have done recently to incorporate all sorts of DEI classes and conferences. So there is there are groups of support, even for first generation students, that didn't exist back then. So, you know, without the support network and without creating yeah. awareness in non-diverse mm-hmm. individuals, it's very hard. So we didn't have that. 20 years ago, that didn't exist. It was not in the radar. So we had to figure things out by ourselves. What I can tell you is many of the students going there were from the Northeast area and they essentially spoke the same language. They had a culture that they understood and we didn't belong there. I mean, it's, it's not that we were not welcome. It was that yeah. we were different. And many times, even in informal conversations, it was very hard to follow what they were talking about. Even the sports were different. Football. <laughs> you know, they were talking about football and lacrosse. I mean, like, what is lacrosse? I had no idea. Yeah. And what about yeah. the other football, as we say in Argentina, football, soccer, how we call them. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So right. that type of Everything. football. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So even discussing sports or even the holidays, you know, Thanksgiving, oh. Thanksgiving, things oh. like that, that you, you don't understand initially. And people assume that you know, right? Yeah. People have... have that since they were born, they assume you know what they are talking about. And you're sitting there like during headlight, headlights look, trying to mm-hmm. pretend that you know what they are talking about. Uh, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And I think that element, that piece may still be present, even with the added support, added introduction of diversity into a greater part of society. But that one piece still tends to be uh, taken for granted in that if you're in the same room, whether it's academic or professional or social, if you are side by side with someone, regardless of where you come from and your background, we tend to believe we took the same journey to get there. Yes, there are many blind spots. Definitely, yes, Consuelo. And I see that in now in the school system for my children. Mm. They're in high school. And the system assumes that as parents, we know what it means to get your kid into college and the SAT, ACT. I'm learning that now. And I have an MBA from an Ivy League. And they assume that I now, because I 
came here for an MBA in a great mm-hmm. school that I know, and I don't know. So we are experimenting with all of this, right? And we right. just don't know because we did not go through that experience. But people mm-hmm. do assume, do assume that because you're sitting in a space where they are, that you have the same yeah. level of knowledge or access or understanding. And that's a big blind spot that we have as a society that we assume, you know, and that mm-hmm. leaves people out, right? From a very early point, which only makes it worse as you move on. You realize what should have been done much yes. earlier. Yes. Yeah. And yet you did extremely well. You went into corporate profession. You did extremely well in, in corporate. And you burned out. What was that? Where did that come from? So when my kids were born in the U.S., we were, you know, only the four of us, my husband and I and my two children were 15 months apart, which was crazy. <laughs> You know, and I had in rest crazy. Yeah, it was very Valeria, crazy. very crazy. <laughs> right? Yeah, it was crazy. Very two babies almost at the same time. So yeah, I had invested so much in my in my education, and I had so much already invested in my professional career with big prospects. You know, I had a global role when I was pregnant with my first baby. Um, I got great feedback about my potential, but then culturally I was told that I had to be the mother taking care of their kids, right? That the mom, Mm -hmm. the woman is the one who has to take care of the kids. And I got that message very clearly from the family in Argentina. And essentially the message was also that the man is a provider, right? And not that I... I had to be the one organizing the caring for the kids. I had to be the one hands-on caring for the kids. And I felt very guilty, you know, hiring somebody to help me. I couldn't trust anybody with my Mm -hmm. babies. I got to the point that all these cultural messages, they were so ingrained in my unconscious that I essentially decided to be a full-time mother and a full-time professional. I was lucky that I lasted seven to eight years, almost a decade doing that, which yeah. was crazy. It was just absolutely crazy. And I was lucky that life stopped me before it got to worse. I had a lot of imbalances, physical, mental, emotional. Oh. I had arrhythmia. My sugar levels were all chronic stress, you know? Chronic stress. Of stress. Mm-hmm. So that's when Constant. life stopped me. And that to me was the blessing that changed my life forever and put me on the path of my purpose. So that actually was a blessing, that situation. A blessing that happened to you where you had enough awareness and that you weren't taking out. And yes, we are grateful. So speak to that moment, that moment of awareness, that moment of almost like defending yourself. Like, no, I won't let myself go to this depth of chronic stress and ailment, and instead I'm meant for a higher purpose. And what is that higher purpose? So first I had to touch bottom, as I said. So that's what really happened. I had a collapse, which was physical, mental, emotional. And I found myself crying for no reason, like babies. My kids were seven and eight, not babies anymore, but little, little kids. Little, still need you 100%. Yeah, Yeah. and I, I was kind of hopeless. And I'm like, how is it possible that I have such a an abundant life with many blessings in so many different areas and healthy family and all these opportunities ahead of me. Not I'm not talking professional and life yeah. opportunities and to enjoy life. How come I'm not enjoying? And I worked so hard to get where I am and now I feel empty. And I said to my husband crying, I'm gonna stop working. I'm gonna take six months off because I want to just recover myself. I'm exhausted. I couldn't get out of bed, essentially. So I decided to take six months off, but I started to have all this energy, right? I had energy. I had to repurpose the energy that I had put before in those professional spaces. So I decided to go to the gym. So I went to the gym and in a a group class, um, a woman was doing an exercise with her arms too close to me and I got hit in my head with 15 pounds and I got a concussion. Talk about life trying to stop you, right? So the universe had a mission for you whether you were there or not. (laughs) Yes. And then a week later, I left my water bottle in the freezer and I forgot. 
And I didn't have much balance. I had a migraine every day and this concussion, I saw double for a while. I couldn't oh look into Lord. anything. Yet. So I grabbed my water bottle from the freezer. I drop it because I had no balance, no coordination on my foot and I break my foot. So then I said, I need to fill <laughs> that. So I have a burnout, you know, Uh-oh. a concussion. You can't make this up. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> and I broke a foot and I'm in my bed, like with a broken foot, the oh. concussion, a headache and everything. And I'm like, how is this even possible? <laughs> what right. happens? But I took it seriously. Right. And I said, this is a message that I have to stop. Like even stop going to the gym. Stop. Just stop. And in that darkness, because I had to heal my migraines and light was bothering me. It was not only darkness inside, it was darkness outside. Yeah. You know, um, I started to be in silence again and to be with myself again. And I had to learn to be with myself. It was mm. entirely disconnected from who I was, what I wanted. I had just kept going throughout my life for the next. What's the next? Mm-hmm. And there was no choice for me in that bedroom than to be in the now and to learn to be in the now. I started to go into meditations. I started when I felt better to read spiritual teachings. I pursued my master's in spiritual sciences. So I started wow. to do work um, that I didn't have time to do before. I didn't have time to read spiritual teachings when I was being a full-time man and a full-time professional. It just didn't have time for me. And I really started to feel different. And when I felt better, I went to an event with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce it was the first time that I was with other Latinos because in corporate, I was possibly the only Latina in the room most of the time. Yeah. And in that event, I felt something in my heart. I felt I, I had fun. I haven't had fun <laughs> for a while, okay? And now I'm yeah. laughing with these people around me, talking Spanish yeah. and feeling different. Like, wow, 15 years in, in the U.S. and I had never experienced this community. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I ended up being, you know, a coach for small businesses, leading an incubator here in New wow. Jersey for, for Hispanic businesses. And as I was healing my own mindset and myself, I started to observe patterns of behavior. And this is where all of what I'm doing right now was born. I said, you know, oh, I feel inferior. Oh, they feel inferior too, because look, they don't negotiate. They shrink a little bit, you know, when the opportunity comes. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't charge my market price in my professional life. I went seven years without asking for a salary increase. Oh, look, they don't charge their worth. They charge less than market price. And when somebody negotiates, they offer a discount immediately. Oh, and they are not asking for what they need, or they are very embarrassed about talking about their success stories and the greatness. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. know, and I started to see patterns of behavior. And I I said, there has to be something cultural. I do it. She does it. He, they do, everybody's doing this. I mean, there are things yeah. that we, we share. And that's when I started to pay attention to the mindsets and the cultural messages. The same, you know, in yes. the same way that I had that message of the mother, the woman is a caregiver and you should stay home and take care of your kids yeah. or put yourself last, right? Serve oh, everybody yes. else. Because putting yourself Huge. first in our culture is not allowed or then you feel guilty. And messages yeah. like that, like, be thankful for what you have. Just be thankful. Don't go for more because right. nothing bad may happen or, you know, be right. modest. Don't talk about yourself. Huge. Do you think that's for the Latinas only? Do you think that's geared more towards the women than the entire culture? So when I wrote my book on colonized Latinas, the research was all about Latinas and I interviewed 55 Latinas. As I went into the world doing speaking, and talent development for different Mm -hmm. organizations, particularly through the Rising Together movement, going to different cities. The topic started to attract other women, Mm -hmm. Asian women, Black women, even white women, and men. Some men (laughs) as well. Some men. Awesome. Awesome. But Mm -hmm. I see this, uh, this theme about the mindsets and the messages we embraced apply to most women. Yes. So when you're talking culture, the culture is what we come from. And that in the Latina Hispanic culture, it's just as you say. Absolutely. Especially when it comes to the modesty. And I'm not yeah. sure that's changing generationally, 
but I heard it from my aunt so often. Um, sin vergüenza. Like, don't, don't you dare be like that. And then yet, this is when we're young and innocent and we don't even know who we are is, is anything different than others. Yes. And that shutting down, that muting of our authentic self happens for a long period of time before we even leave the house yes. and venture out. Yes. So when you came to the chamber and had that awesome <laughs> epiphany of like, oh, my soul has been silenced by coming here to the U.S., yes. did you know at the time who you really were because you left home to go to university? It's a young person. And then you went through a major adult phase here in the U.S., in that held back modest sense, did you have any idea who you really were at that time? No, I became a walking brain, as I said, mm. um, as I always say, no, I disconnected from my essence. But at that moment, when I had that burnout and I started to reconnect with my essence, and that to me is, you know, your soul, yeah. the inner wisdom, the voice of the intuition, the inner world. The inner world that so many times, you know, when we're running around working and doing everything we do, we forget that we have an, it's all in the mind, right? right. And when I gave myself the time to reconnect with that essence, I started to feel things that I felt when I was little in Argentina, when I was in my hometown, you know, what I love to do. I had like a spiritual life in itself. I remember with my older brother, we loved music and we used to go to church just to listen and sing to the music. Oh, you know, in Argentina, they play yeah. the guitar. Yeah, in, in church in Argentina, it's not the same as in the U.S. It's a uh -huh. little bit, bit more cultural and they play the guitar. More modern, maybe? More modern, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But I had a spirituality and, and to me that was not just the music, but also the connection with nature. And I had this inner dialogue with the higher power. And I was asking for help when I needed that. As a mm -hmm. little girl, I remember that very well. And then I completely forgot. I moved to Buenos Aires when I was 18 and life took over and I disconnected from that. So to me, it was a reconnection through this mm -hmm. very difficult moment in my life where I had all sorts of dark thoughts, right? And it was mm -hmm. hard, but in that space of silence and it reconnected with that essence. And that's where everything changed. And I started to suddenly ask myself, why am, am I here on the planet? There must be a purpose. And if I received all these blessings, this education that no one in my family ever got or could dream of, right. how can I use this now, you know, to better the community or people around me? Because I love people, right? I love to, to be with people. I, it fills my heart. So that, yeah. that's when I started. It was a slow process, building each day a little bit more. But the core of that, of that um, you know, like uh, coming back from the, the ashes. <laughs> it, was, uh, yes. it was an epiphany. Yeah, it, it was, was my spirituality. Like a, yes. Yeah. They call it Phoenix Rising, the Phoenix Rising Phoenix out of the rising. ashes. And you come, you come whole again. You're, yeah. You were uh, healing, healing yourself to get back to who you were born to be. Exactly. And part of that consola was also um, when you start to heal from inside, you start mm. to heal your self-worth. You start yes. to heal your sense of self. So you start feeling more abundant versus lacking and that you deserve right good things in life. Yes. And, and that's how that transformation started to happen. And I started to believe deep in my heart that I deserved a happy life, that I deserved to enjoy the abundance in my life and that I was a whole human being. Yes, I am a human being and I will trip over, make mistakes, mess up. But, you know, learning to have compassion and to say, I am learning. I am a human being. I am learning and I can be compassionate versus harsh and go, go, go and discipline with myself. You know, it's, it's, in essence, is self-love, right? Yes. Giving to yourself what you need at that point and listening to your needs and doing what you need to do to make yourself happy. Beautiful. Yes, and definitely in complete opposite direction than the cultural upbringing of go, 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 especially coming to the U.S. Prove your success, prove you're worth it, prove that, yes, an immigrant Latina can be successful and be equal and have equity 
Uh, but getting on that track, and a previous guest, um, Dr. Joanna Feliciano, had said, the hamster wheel. She's a friend. Which is perfect. She's my oh, friend. Oh, I love her. Yes. We're serving that word together. <laughs> That's right. Of no course place. you do. Yeah, of course you do. Yes. The hamster I, wheel. I didn't yeah. put that together. The hamster wheel makes so much sense because, and I think this is really helpful for a lot of the younger Latinas, no matter if you're not whole, like you say, if you're not who you are born to be, no matter how hard you run on that hamster wheel of success to prove to yourself how far you can go, how successful you can be in, in the wrong frame of mind, successful on someone else's terms. Yes. Doesn't matter. You will burn out. It's not sustainable. Exactly. Be someone and you are not. Yeah. yeah exactly. And you articulated that so beautifully. And for Latinas and other women of color, these messages that we receive that we're somehow inferior and we have less to offer, right? And that mm -hmm. we need to be safe by making ourselves oh, smaller gosh. and invisible, that we need to work hard, putting our heads down, not asking for what we need. Those are ways that you, you don't grow in the U.S., so those cultural messages become interference. And I learned that that interference keep you away from connecting with your essence and your power. So the work mm -hmm. that I started to do with people is to help them see the interference so that we clean the windshield and they can see more clearly where they are going. And uh. that comes from the connection with their essence and their hearts. So the noise and many times the voice of self-sabotage or, you know, that the diminishing voice, what do you know? Because as kids, we heard that a lot. Kids don't have an opinion mm -hmm. here. What do you know? Callate la boca. So things like that we heard, right? That's true. Uh, and right. also, you know, a big, another big one cultural is that each time we challenged authority, we were punished. So now we say yes to everything. And, and I see this in the speakers that I do with women that the yes, of course, is so prevalent in women that we're always like, mm -hmm. can you do this? Yes, of course. Can you do it? Yes. And we say yes too fast before understanding what we're committing to. Then we're overworked, exhausted, right? And putting everybody and we don't take the time to say, let me think about it. Let me understand what you're asking about. And you know, really understand if that is a language yeah. what we need to do for ourselves or even our growth journey. So that's one aspect, all this noise from the culture. The second aspect that you mentioned, the hamster wheel, is I'm looking into how we live in the U.S. and with teenager kids, I see this also reflected. In the U.S., first world economy, there is this pressure to be successful to the expense of your own emotions. So vulnerability is not a good thing. Like you need to be strong, you need to be successful, you need to put your best face and show to the world that you are strong and, you know, that you got it. Because the moment you show the world that you are in pain, emotional pain, struggling, not feeling well, you are not okay, that's perceived as you are a loser. Yes. So, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people start now taking pills or smoking or drinking mm -hmm. and all these diseases that we have in this country. Mental mm -hmm. health is an issue. But why? Because we push everything down because the system is pushing yes. us to show the perfection of the successful and the winner and the number one. And you know what? That's not true. It's not the it's wholeness just... of who we are. It is yeah. okay not to be okay. And, yeah. you know, that's a conversation we need to have. That's the way to heal, right? To accept first that you are not okay. Unless there is acceptance, there is no healing. Yeah, no, that's really well and powerfully said because it is systemic and there is a sense that, like you say, you have to hit a white man's definition of what success is. The work that I do and what I discuss with women is we need to embrace that we have the power to influence a new culture. As Latinas, we come from the culture of the heart. Yes. Here in the U.S., we're in the culture of the mind. And there is no better or worse culture. They are just different. So how can we merge the power of the culture of the mind, that clearly artificial <laughs> intelligence, all the gadgets you can imagine, technological <laughs> progress, 
and the culture yeah. of the heart that is more about personal relationships, caring about the other person, deeply caring, mm-hmm. nurturing, compassion, good compassion, understanding, yeah. you know, so yeah. yeah, how can we merge both? And that's something that those of us who have that diversity yes. and we have been experiencing that and live that, we could have that power of bringing that asset to the world that today needs it so much. Yes, I totally stand behind that. I love how you express that because I really feel that women of color, and I only know the Latina story, but, you know, Latinas bring so much to the table in that regard because the strength that we don't talk about, a lot of it has come from I think the day we were born, we always had to figure things out for ourselves. And if women came to the, like yourself, came to the country, you had to figure out an entire different culture, some an entire different language, and still be held to the same level of success. And that's incredible. That Mm -hmm. power, if you can bring that for yourself, imagine what you could bring for a company when it comes to that analytical intellectual mindset but what we bring that doesn't exist but is is actually being asked for i think by the younger generation is we bring empathy we bring empathetic leadership because we understand we've been through it we've gone through it and we we don't want others to go through that for myself being earlier here in like you say when women were starting to become professional They just mimicked what the men were doing and they closed the doors on a lot of other women rather than kicking them all open, opening the back exit windows, everything like get in here. But this is all the experience that brought you to write your book, Uncolonized Latinas, because you did not want other women to keep going down this path that brought you to that burnout, right? Yes, and I also wanted to find a way to communicate all that I was learning about these mindsets because there is not much much research about the cultural mindsets and how these messages you heard growing up, not just from your parents, figures of authority, the system itself, how um, they leave a mark on you and they influence your behavior. So here's the thing. A big one is I was told that I'm from a third world country. I heard that in Argentina all the time. This is a third world country. And now they call them developing economies, which is politically correct. But imagine what it does to you when you show up as an immigrant and you're like, I'm from from a third world country. You feel that you have nothing to contribute. So those messages are pervasive, but they are real. And so many times we struggle with not having in our lives the results that we want. You know, we want more opportunities, professional growth, make more money to say a CEO, feel fulfilled, feel recognized and respected, uh, to feel like a viable contributor, that uh, a leader, to stand up as mm, a leader. Yes. And so many times people in our community struggle with that. What they don't see is that there are some behaviors that we share, not speaking up or feeling absolutely uncomfortable speaking up, not building these networks of sponsors and mentors to grow our careers, missing opportunities to talk about ourselves and building our own professional brands, being excessively modest. Those behaviors that create real results in your life are influenced by these mindsets and ways of thinking. So if we want to change our results, we need to change our behaviors. But for the behavior to change long-term and to be sustainable, we need to change our mindset. And that's an important discussion that we have not had. So I'm excited, you know, I put that in my book. I started to do workshops and full day experiences for Latinas and other women and a few men. But something that the book opened my eyes to, particularly two things. One is, the existence of translators in our community. I had no idea as an immigrant that kids of immigrants whose parents don't master the English language or the culture, those kids from okay. very young age had to translate the language and the culture for their parents. 
what happens is they they faced a system that was not welcoming of their parents. Mm. And they had to translate dismissive comments directly to their parents, like from doctors or government offices or even schools. They had to mm-hmm. translate dismissive messages word by word, you know? So if that's something no. to you. No, not to. When I said yeah, little kid. Absolutely. Do you have that experience? Not so much for the translating, I'll say, because she was certified by Cambridge University in English in Peru because she worked for the British Embassy. But the dismissiveness mm. here when she came, being fluent, absolutely fluent in two languages and having that authority to be in charge of the accounting department at the British Embassy. Wow. Spoke levels above a lot of the men here in the U.S. And yet the dismissiveness and it, that spanned across the board, whether it was professional, medically, uh, not taking her seriously. And seeing that as a young girl, it made me angry. Mm. And it made me build up a personality of, oh, oh, hell no. Hell no, is that going to happen anymore? Mm. And then it, that compounded, oh, a thousand percent because I had two daughters. And I just wanted to stop that cultural shaming and that dismissiveness but there's only so much you can shut out you still are carrying those voices because it's not as though being raised as a child you knew to shut them out right just became who you are you didn't have a choice Um, so i really value what you're saying in in your book uncolonized latinas because for so much even though we have the awareness even though we come back to ourselves and feel soulfully connected, we still find these tangles of cultural fragments in us that are just like, but when you read it in your book and you see it through other people's experiences, then you go, oh, wait a minute. That's happening to me too. Love how you express it. That does add confidence in it because you you value yourself so much yes. more. Even if it's like, for me, it's like a conduit. When I see it happening in others, I don't want it to happen to them. And I look in the mirror and it's like, well, I don't want it to happen to me either. So you raise yourself. Um, And talk about raising yourself, then this rising together movement, this immense edifice of rising together movement. What do you want the Latinas to know about this movement? So the movement is a collective movement. So what happened is that with my book, I was asked to speak. And generally, when they invite you to speak in organizations and corporations, they invite you for one hour during Hispanic Heritage Month. And I'm very clear. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's true. true. And then I'm like, so true. Yeah. And I'm like, because okay. you're different, because you're Hispanic, and now we could pull you out and show you off. Exactly. So I'm like, (laughs) you know, and I take my mission and purpose to yeah. heart. And yeah, of course, I will show up for one hour, but I want everybody to know that these are topics of mindset changing, which can be life changing. So how much can I help you change your mindset in one hour? I can promise yeah. you to get a couple of insights, to commit to doing something different, but one hour is not enough. So that's when the idea came up of How about we go to different cities in the U.S. for a full day experience? And in that full day, we will go much deeper, much deeper, Mm -hmm. much deeper. And it's amazing what happens in the room. We really have real conversations. The one we're having now with Mm -hmm. Latinas from college age to almost retirement, different races, some of them born here, some others born abroad, different languages even corporate, academic spaces, entrepreneurs, students. So it's a big mix and variety. And something that happens in addition to discussing this mindset and finding common ground, creating community. And also we have discussions on how are we going to do things differently? Mm. What can we do? Because it's time Mm -hmm. for action, right? To do things differently. So the Rising Together movement has been in... Tennessee, in Texas, and in Boston, Massachusetts. And we only go where there is some light that shows up and says, we want to have the Rising Together moment here. So we don't push. We are not seeking, Ah. but we react 
to requests that people want these where they are. So that's what, what's going on at the Racing Together movement. So the next des- destination, I'm saying New York City because I'm very close. I- I'm okay. Making it easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> New York or San Francisco? Yeah, well, maybe we come to the West Coast. You were almost there, but West Coast. You know, why not? 2024. <laughs> yeah, that could be okay. you know, an intention. I would love to. So yes. that's what's happening is I'm learning that we crave for spaces where we can yeah. express what we carry mm-hmm. and people feel relief when they see others carried the same. Because mm-hmm. it's not that you are a problem or that something is wrong with you. Is the culture influenced mm-hmm. you in a certain way to think or see things in a certain way? So there is relief initially. Then there is this self empowerment of okay. Then that means I can change it, you know. And then there is this um, community component of women working with women and making new friends and new connections that stay in the city after we. Yes. Oh, congratulations! That's beautiful. Absolutely, and. It seems so simple and yet been denied it or don't know how to instigate it or don't even know that it's an issue because yeah. we think it's us. We, we think, think it's me. us and we try to make ourselves fit in, not assimilate necessarily. We love our Latina selves, but we still have to feel like fitting in, yeah. even if we're only doing it with 10% of our person. And and that other 90% is just dying. It's not being fed. It's not being fueled. Uh, but you get a group together and if there's music playing, oh, that's a whole different vibe. This and starts food. happening. There's always food. <laughs> yeah, food and conversation and music and everyone starts dancing. That's something about here that's very um, isolating. It's just the culture itself here. Yes. I really feel like you're speaking when you say cultures. Yes, we are raised as Latinos into in a culture that is very, um, like you say, restrictive when it comes to the women. But also the culture here in the U.S. is very restrictive when it comes to women. Definitely, yes. yes. And it doesn't, it doesn't embrace and welcome no. everything that women have to offer and, and who they just are. But that's also why I do the, the podcast, is to give a safe platform for women to speak their truth, to share what it's like. Yeah. And you know, you said something yeah. really important, which is we only bring 10% of who we are. And part of that is because when we feel threatened and we feel we don't belong or we feel yeah. different, we go into survival mode. And when yes. you go into survival mode, which I call it unnecessary survival, because our ancestors, they had to survive. Like yeah. we come from systemic poverty, even human trafficking, violence. You know, our countries had a lot of struggles. And yeah. which if we go back in history, they've been systemic since the colonization times. The resources yes. were depleted. So that's why we, our countries have been poor. Because stolen. They, they, <laughs> they, they took stolen. away. Yes. yes. Stolen. They the took gold, away. The gold, the resources, yeah. the people. So oh. there are developed economies or first world economies because mm-hmm. they took the resources that we had, right? So, right. and this is not a blaming game. Honestly, if you look at how I look, I look a European and going with blue eyes with a very big Latina heart, but God, it's funny. <laughs> And put me in this package, okay? So, <laughs> yes, no, uh, uh, yes. So it's interesting to see that, but that's where I come from. That's where my ancestors came from. But because mm-hmm. I was born surrounded by systemic poverty, my grandmother did not even have shoes. She had 17 brothers and sisters working the wow. lands in Argentina. So my other grandma had to stand on a little stool to wash the dishes at somebody's house. So there has been a, a very close to us that survival, if don't, not having enough to pay. If my parents' fridge today breaks, that's a problem. Like I need to come to the rescue in a way. So survival is very still prevalent in our families back in Latin America and very close in, in generations. So 
when we feel threatened in these rooms, in these workspaces, we go to survival because that's all we know. So when we show up as our 10%, it's because we're afraid. The tendency is to shrink, to be in your safe space and not to speak up, right? So that's when you don't show up entirely because you're in fear. And this is something that I shared in Boston when we were doing the Race into Our Movement. When you're in fear, all you can see is maybe around your eyelids. Like you don't connect with the room. When you're in fear, you are not present in a way that you read other people's reactions to what you're saying. How can you be effective, Uh, right, in your work if you're in such fear that you are in panic mode and you cannot even read the people around you or express yourself in ways that will convince them with the idea that you're presenting? You know, so we have so much to offer. But if we come from a place of survival, that's when we put ourselves in a shell and operate only at 10%. I've been there. I used to flash. My full face was red. I was tripping over with my words and sweating (laughs) profusely. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. (laughs) Yeah. What I have here today does not know. Well, Mm. because, you know, I I learned breathing techniques. So I learned to calm my nervous system down. I do some visualization before I go into a meeting. I visualize myself succeeding in certain spaces. I don't allow my brain to, you know, come up with all these these scenarios of tragic consequences yeah. or a pos- oh. what could possibly happen. Yes. Which I think is another so, thing we we get trained because we come out of that survival. Yes. You get trained to think the worst. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? Well, so, and then you could get fixated on that so easily and that can freeze you. That, oh, well, I shouldn't go down that path of starting my own business, of buying a house, of moving to a different place, of doing anything new because it's not a matter of failure necessarily. It's that survival. Yes. So I wouldn't be in this, you know, worst possibility that could happen if I had just stayed home and did whatever I did and didn't ask for a raise and didn't change my job. And that, that is the depth of cultural training that gets embedded and really freezes us. Oh, I just love the power in everything you're saying and, and that you're bringing forward so much information from being around the women and hearing their stories and providing these summits that you have with the rising together. And we've heard so much from you. However, we still want to know more. (laughs) Tell us something about you. People, even knowing you this much, even sharing yourself this much, what people not associate with you? Who are you and what do you love that they would never connect you with? Hmm. Um... Two things, basically. One is that I do snowboard. I'm a snowboarder. I'm 47 years old and I snowboard and I go very fast. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think that very I much in want. keeping with Valeria. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I, that's what nice. I've been doing since I got in the U.S. in Hanover, New Hampshire. Long winters, okay. short days. So you have to keep yourself out there doing something to not get depressed. <laughs> so I snowboard and something okay. else. Yeah. You know, I'm very, very involved in spirituality, even with, with groups and communities across the country and in Latin America. And that's something that I usually do not discuss too much. Um, it's very private, even with my uh-huh. family, not so much, but it's uh-huh. a major pillar and I'm very active in that. And in these corporate spaces, that's something that I do not entirely talk mm-hmm. about. However, it's sprinkled in everything that I do. And I repackage the words that I say. Yeah. But what I'm learning and the spiritual teachings and the importance of spirituality and connecting with the essence of who you are as a soul having a human experience, that's what I, it's in my 24 seven and in my DNA. And that's what gives me, you know, the sense of purpose and the happiness and keeps me going. Yeah. Yeah. You are one person. You're one beautifully whole, powerfully person and you're living that one life 
that one life, the same person shows up in all the different arenas that you love being in, whether it's with Latinas or snowboarding or corporate or presenting. It's the same person with the same message because you're living yourself fully. All this energy you're putting back into a very empathetic, empowering lesson, teaching. What do you hope to see happening? Where's the shift that you want to see most happen in your lifetime? I would love to see our Latina women. First of all, all women working together with the support of allies. I want to see equal opportunities, equal access. I want to see equal pay. But more than anything, what I really want to see is for all of us to learn to value the person next to us. As human beings, we learn to put people in pedestals. So we have VIP, celebrities, Mm -hmm. and it seems that some people's lives are worth more than others. And we do that. We put people in categories. Mm -hmm. What I would love to do is for us as humans to really embrace the value of being human, being alive right now on the planet and embracing the person next to us in the the ordinary. It is good to be ordinary. Let's go back to that. And to embrace that the ordinary life is where God resides, is where the power to transform their world is, is not in the small pockets of power and VIP spaces. The power to transform the world is in the ordinary person like us sitting here having this amazing Mm -hmm. conversation. And the more of us who awaken to that, to that power we have, and we start creating around us the world we want and asking, yes. demanding that things yes. happen in a certain way, that's when we will see the change. So that's what I want to see in a way, that, that we are united in our diversity, that we honor the value of human lives, and that being ordinary becomes a good thing, not being a loser. Right? Becomes a yeah. good thing to be ordinary yeah. that that's value Aspire and there's to. power in that. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's going to happen. I think it's really going to happen. Yes. I think it is happening already. So you're walking through a portal into your most joyful moment, into 100% Valeria showing up without uh, having to mimic. This is Valeria universe. Uh huh. What does it look like? Heaven on earth, that's what it looks like. And to me, that means that we see 3D again, that we see color again, that we see life again, that we appreciate being alive, that we express abundance, that we express love to the people that surround us. That's what it looks like. It's heaven on earth. That we start seeing the glass half full versus always looking for what's missing. No, yeah, that's what it looks like. And it's a vibrant place where we are not afraid to express who we are, that the word self-love is something that you can't even say in a corporate setting, that there is Mm -hmm. purpose and mission in everything we do every day, and that we can honor the lives that we have at this point on the planet and make ourselves happy, starting with us. That's what my universe looks like. (laughs) Oh, I, I, I'm so glad that your universe tracked you back on track because all of this being lost in a stale corporate setting would have, I think, <laughs> tilted the world upside down. Like, forget it. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. So your book, Uncolonized Latinas, Transforming Our Mindsets and Rising Together, Where can this be purchased? How can the community engage with you? And so I have a, yeah, I have a website, valeriaaloe.com. That's (laughs) valeriaalo in English.com. And also you can visit uncolonizedlatinas.com and even download the introduction of the book. Both in Spanish are in English and in English in Mm. both languages. You can download the introduction and read it to get a sense of what the book is about. And I'm sure you will love it. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It has so many powerful stories all in one place. So what would be the 
one piece because it's a lot. It's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to unpack if you've born here and you've lived this all your life. Maybe you're on that hamster wheel. Maybe you've hit the burnout. It's a lot. Yes. What is the one piece that you would suggest a Latina to consider? Just one little piece where you can stop all of it. What would be that go-to piece, you think? I'm going back to when I had my concussion and the broken foot and all that experience. Creating time to be with yourself, to get to know who you are, spend time with you, get to know who you are, get to like who you are and get to trust who you are. And that starts creating spaces of connection with you, not with your, the phone or distractions. It's like in the most uncomfortable place, which is do five minutes of silence every day. It's unbelievable how uncomfortable we get with only blocking five minutes to just sit down, close our eyes, tune in with our internal world and breathe. It's crazy. People don't do it. And I gave this as homework in many of my talks and people resist. Why? It, because that seems like a long time. Actually. Yeah. For me, it seems like a long or time. Or maybe start with silent. one minute. I, I think I would. I'm too chatty. I even talk to my no, animals. Like my cat runs away. Like oh, there she goes again. I yes. to stay silent in my own thoughts for five minutes. That does seem like a long time. Yeah, but that's why it's so life changing. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. Maybe, but that after the end of five minutes, I might leave a note on the door for my husband. Like I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I found myself. Bye. <laughs> no, no, I, I won't do that. I won't do that. Happened. You may never know what no, might no. happen. <laughs> I would leave an address. You can find me here. Yes. And 2024, the Racing Together movement is going to San Francisco. We, we already said that. Right. <laughs> you heard it here first. We have declared it. We have taken your space. You are coming to San Francisco next year, 2024, because, oh, we have the women here for you. Absolutely. They want this. Absolutely. And your book. Excellent. 2024 days. Yes. Thank you so Gracias, very, very much. Manuel. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you for the work you do. Oh, and you. I love it. Together, we will make this happen. And every you little point. You guys. <laughs> this time. It is more than time. <laughs> ah, we've lived through too much. Well, did you go through the whole box of tissues? Did I not warn you? Ah, oh, did you get that sense of power of wanting to stand with her as she shared her story? To want to have been there way before 15 years passed for her and just provide her that community, la comunidad, that she realized was missing in her life. Oh, it just felt like Rocky at the end, like, yes, arms raised, fist pumping, yes speaking from her soul, encouraging us to live in the moment, free from modern distractions and cultural interference, to embrace this amazing life we have. A beautiful reminder that we have what we need for true happiness, and if we get caught up in the false definition of success that takes us off our intended destiny, oh boy, this is a great warning. That the universe will definitely knock us off that path and make us sit with ourselves for a minute or five minutes, as Valeria gives out for her homework. Such a beautiful soul. Her true essence, gratefully saved and resurrected from that harsh and sterile life that just wasn't hers. This is a fabulous episode to share with your family and friends, and we truly appreciate you doing so. Remember to follow or subscribe to the podcast so these episodes show up on your listing device every week because you wouldn't want to miss one like this that could change your life, even save your life. Check out the show notes for the article on Valeria Lowe on our website at thelinks.com. That's L N double X, double X for the ladies. And the information she shared with us today. Her book, Uncolonized Latinas, Transforming Our Mindsets and Rising Together, is available in print, ebook, and audio, and you can download a free chapter from her website at valeriaalo.com, or as she teases in the end, 
ValeriaAllo.com and follow her on Instagram at ValeriaAllo. I really look forward to next week's Pod Club episode where we dive into the gems that you heard here today. Can't wait to hear any of your comments. DM me on Instagram what you all came up with in your five minutes of sitting with yourself. I don't know if I can do it. (laughs) But letting go of all the messages that don't seek to nurture your soul and the opportunities that arise from your clarity, free from distractions, free from cultural interference. We got this, ladies. Step into your truth. Ciao. Really appreciate the time we take to rate and review the podcast. Get the backstory and what you've heard here today and reach out to us at thelinks.com. That's L N double X. Because it's about time, it's about us. Stay in the groove on our social media at Lifelinks and get ready to make your move, ladies. <laughs>